Yeah, let's hear from the ch chicas <laughs> in the audience. <laughs> Las chiquitas. Ow! Ow, 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 ow! Our lineup today includes Alice Weinreb, who is a food activist and Loyola history professor. It also includes, we're very excited to welcome Ann Christofferson and Lynn Bubon, uh, Linda Bubon of the Women and Children First Bookstore. Plus, let's hear it. Jill and Kung Fung. I was about to say that, but there you go. Jill's joining I, I us. I see well. I screwed up the pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> Kung Fung. And, uh, but we're going to start off the show today. A very special show with a very special person. Uh, full disclosure, I love this woman. Uh, she's, uh, she's a sister from uh, the reading group that will we'll not name it because that's a secret and we'd have to kill you if we told you. But anyway, uh, we've been in the same reading group for over 20 years. Uh, but Mimi, Mimi started out being a meaningful and gorgeous and talented and hip woman before I was ever born. So we're going to uh, share with Mimi Harris Whoa. some stories and International Women's Day. Welcome to Life from the Heartland. Well, Mimi. I'm overwhelmed by that intro. Kate. I know. Let's just roll down and make out or something. No. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there you have. <laughs> Sleaze well heard from. No, sorry. <laughs> I'm That's sorry. It. She's setting the tone for ah! International Women's Day. Things are changing all over the world. <laughs> oh, God help us. Mimi, uh, let's welcome you again and start over. Uh, we love you. Welcome to Live from the Heartland. Well, this is the only show that gets me going early in the morning on Saturday, so it's got to be good. I see a couple of friends of yours made it up early, too. I want to applaud yeah. them. This is huge for uh, a few other women I know in the audience. Um, Mimi, one of the reasons that um, we invited you actually was one of our cohorts on the show Dan got Kugler, he said it'd Dan, be great to have Mimi on the show. Dan got into an interesting conversation with you at a gathering we had not long ago, and he said, this woman is fascinating. Well, we were drinking a lot of wine. <laughs> well, that helps. I know that helps. But we said, of course she's fascinating. And then we looked at each other and said, well, let's have her on the show. So, um, Mimi, when did you, um, where did you start out? Did you start out up the block? What? So, yeah, it all, really all kind of started for me. My, my parents were like armchair liberals, but my mom actually, when Independent Voters of Illinois started, my mom was one of those ladies. Huh. And she took me on the street corner. We lived over on Fargo, between Greenview and Sharon. She took me over on the street corners, and we were we were talking about actually affordable health care but it was called then they said it was socialized medicine so we know this was really pretty far back guys give me uh, give me a decade the 40s the 40s okay the 40s so that was my mama and we were also yelling about some guy who was in the congress named ralph church who was a republican congressman from this district so so that started me out ah and then uh, when I was 13 and going to Gale school we did a the Chicago you know how you do the Chicago project where you do something about Chicago so my parents took me down to West Madison Street which at that time was Skid Row and I was like totally blown away by what I saw, and from then on, I was like a passionate change the world person, you know? Um, and, but that's when it started, so I was like about nine. Um, and then later, I, I went, you know, in, when I was in high school, Henry Wallace was running for president. 1948. So, oh, God. So, so. Um, we are going to say your age. I was so, six. You know, just relax. <laughs> I know you passed 80 that's recently. Okay. So, that's part of the deal, girl. You've been an activist all your life, that's and here right. you are. Yes, yeah, so I'm now. Yeah, and this also blows my mind. But in any <laughs> case, um, I brought people down to. I was away at Francis Scheimer. And I oh. brought people down to there to do um, a presentation for Henry Wallace, 
which of course was, this was a girls' school at the time, a boarding school. Oh, I didn't realize they started Yeah, out. even though it was under the UFC plan and all that, uh -huh. but it was, Shimer, it was a boarding school. That's when it was out on the long, out west? It was west. in Mount Carroll, Illinois. Yeah. Mount Carroll. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So, um, and then a Roosevelt University. Or college then. Actually, yeah. there were a lot of uh, radicals there. It was all a bunch of <laughs> radical Jews and black folks. Well, that was but, where uh, Harold Washington. And Harold, he, he preceded me by a few years, but yes. And, and that's and why. Don Clark Netch. Don Clark Netch was also at Roosevelt. Well, she gave me one of my first jobs when I was first married. Really? Yeah. Um, so uh, she was wonderful. She ran something called Citizens Information. Right, Whatever. Citizens Information yeah. Service. She was great, God rest her soul. So when, when you say all this, wh who were your earliest influences? Well, like, so I met Margaret when I was at Roosevelt. Margaret Burroughs. Yeah, I, her husband Charlie, with his big deep voice guy from Russia, he, he was a black man that had been raised in Russia and trained as a clown. So he was, one, he was one of my big buddies, and he took me home, and I met Margaret. And so Margaret had this whole little scene out there, and um, Margaret and Charlie, and I was there every weekend with them, and I became part of the Southside Community Arts Center Terrific. Um, with them. And actually, Margaret introduced me to my husband, Sid, at a Halloween party, trick or treat, right? Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> well, I uh, I had the honor of meeting you when uh, Johnny Rawson, who had the Three Penny Cinema and owned most of the Latino theaters in town, uh, had a group of us who were became rising up angry, but we were helping him uh, get the theater ready. And then, so you were around, and then uh, we started going to the theater, and we would see Rodeo and Montegre Pop, and then there was a Hail Hero with uh, Michael Douglas. Uh, there was a number of interesting little movies, that, and the Battle of Algiers was playing That's there. That's what we opened and with. And you had someone working there named Stormy, Diane Libman, who I met and became my wife. So I've always been indebted to you for meeting my first wife through you, Mimi. That's and, true. And uh, it's good to see you. You've been coming around the heartland since we opened. We have a nice photograph of you sitting over in the, the next. It may have been right there where the soundboard is. Right there. And yes. uh, you kind of were toasting everybody, or you're sitting there. You look great. You still look great. And one of the <laughs> things that I, in talking with you, you have reminded me of a number of uh, women who have been not only influential in your life, but also, I think, for many of us. And you mentioned Margaret Burroughs, but uh, why don't you tell us about a few other people? i got a list here. You want to tell us about Ruth Rothstein? Well, yeah, Ruthie. So Ruthie Rothstein was a friend of my husband's. Ruthie Rothstein, who recently passed, Ruth uh, uh, was originally a labor organizer for fur and leather workers. And her husband was a labor lawyer. And when, um, and they were friends of my husband. They were all older. My husband was older than, than I was by 15 years. And he fought in the Spanish Civil War. And, and um, yeah, for, let me interrupt you just to say we started with your husband and then went, but one or, one or two things about Sid before you go to Ruth. Well, I really loved him. Yeah. <laughs> he was a great guy. <laughs> he was a great guy, was a wonderful photographer. Um, in fact, he had a show here Post at the Heartland, there. which I really appreciated that we, we had here. He, he really covered. He did a lot for labor. He put, he put out some newspapers for labor. But he covered really the history. Carl Sandberg t uh, said that the picture Sid took of him was the best he ever took, yeah. ever had. And mm -hmm. Sid was a self-taught photographer, yeah. you know? Came up through the streets. He was a boxer, right. um, dr drove a truck, did all kinds of things. And then when we got married, um, he became, he, well, he had already become a photographer, but he was a fabulous photographer, and he covered all the uh, the main people in that in our historical period: yeah. Martin Luther King and uh, Cesar Chavez. Cesar Chavez. We were and reminded of his scope when your son 
put together a retrospective right. of his work not that long ago, two, three years ago. Yes. Um, here on the walls. Right. Let me just ask you, are there, are there any members of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade still alive in town? Not in town. I don't okay. think They're so. all right. gone. They, They're all, all right, gone. So let's the go last back one to died a year ago. So anyway, Ruth. Ruthie Rothstein, though, was a friend of, so... Uh, Ruthie, so Ruthie and her husband were friends of Sid. And so when we start, when Sid started his photography business, Ruthie had stopped being a labor organizer and she started working in the hospital industry on, on community relations at Jackson Park Hospital. Oh, wow. Jackson and I got Park. to really know her because she used to help sit out. He was starting out his business and she would hire him all the time, whenever possible. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so Ruthie became the head of she headed up Mount Sinai and transformed Mount Sinai. She became the head of it. And then she became the head of Cook County Hospital, and she really, really transformed Cook totally. County Hospital. Ruthie only had a high school education. She I love that part the best. She never had college. I love so that the she best. Was always, she, was, she was always my hero because she did it by the seat of her pants, like I did. Yes. Too. You also were at the start of, um, what was the name of the women? Women's Strike for Peace. Women's Strike for Peace, yeah. yeah. Talk yeah. about that just well, a little bit. Well, I was one, I, I, oh, I don't think, is no? it still, I thought no, I saw it in California, around, I saw it. It, need, uh, it doesn't we'll need check. to be in, in that form. But anyway, I was one of the founders of that, that in Chicago, women, in case people don't know, women all over the country kind of went out on strike on one day. Give us a year. We were all kind of... The year? Well, decade. Okay, so was that in the was 50s? in the... Yeah, it was in the 50s. Right. Okay. It was when... And I was freaking out because I had started having babies and they were doing all this, this radiation testing, atomic bomb testing. And I was like really pretty freaked out about mm -hmm. my what was going to happen for my family, as I'm sure women are today. Yeah. Um, and um, so this designer in Washington, Dagmar Wilson, she got this idea and it traveled across the country. Remember, we, we had TV and stuff, but, but we didn't have media like we have now. And, and she... All the women went out on one day, we hit the streets. And boy, did that make uh, <laughs> news and history. That was a major deal. Because we were, in those days, let's remember, we were really kind of feeling our way, but we were pretty suppressed. It was, uh, it was the... Um uh, I just lost her name, Betty Friedan era. Well, yeah, and Betty Friedan had a big influence. She was a real game changer for me because Betty Friedan wrote this book, The Feminine Mystique. I started reading this book, and I, I totally freaked out on that one. <laughs> and my reaction was to, I would go upstairs. We lived in Old Town. We, you know, we you had so this. Hip. Huh? You were so hip. We had this kind of... Oh well, I won't even go there. A crash pad, um, as it were. But we were, we were. Uh, <laughs> if you could I only see the smile on her face when she says, "I won't go there." Most people well, watching on you youtubecom <laughs> Heartland Media will see that. <laughs> I know. Anyway, with crazy. Betty for Dan. So I was in the middle of cooking and cleaning and raising children and so on and so forth and trying to help my husband with his business and getting involved in my community. Uh, and she uh, wrote this book, and I started reading it, and I would run upstairs, read the book, and then I would run downstairs and madly bake bread or clean incessantly. I was so freaked out by the book, by what it was showing me and what it was opening my eyes to, that m my husband looked in amazement at how domestic I had become. <laughs> during that period of reading that book. That so is she was such like an interesting you know, effect it had on you. Yeah. My memory of Betty Friedan uh, was with a bunch of women being freaked out too, but they were freaked out because they were sorority women at Lake Forest College. <laughs> and when we brought her to Lake Forest, 
and she spoke. The, the, the house mothers and the sorority women just were, they, they didn't know how to deal with it. But Betty Friedan was yeah. something else. Yes, yeah, she was something else. She was something else. So she had a big, uh, a huge influence on me. But we were like feeling our way. We didn't really have official movements and stuff. And I always kind of played it that way. I was part of groups, but I wasn't like you, Michael, you know, you and Storm, you know, a lot of people went into kind of strong movement groups. That was not my, that was not really my thing. I, but Women Strike for Peace, I did the, I headed up the radiation committee because we were so concerned then about our kids were getting radiated. There's one of my kids right there. Um, mm -hmm. And um, Say how many kids in, that you had in their names. Pardon me? Say the names of your children and how. So I actually have, so I have my, my husband's three kids from previous, previous uh -huh. liaisons. That's Paul, Jerry, and David. And then Sid and I had Mark, Adam, and Suzanne. So after five boys, we had a girl, which was really amazing to us. Who looks exactly like you. And you look like just you. like each other. <laughs> oh, thank you. She's well, very I mean, beautiful. she's a little younger, but. Slightly. <laughs> you know, uh, one of the, uh, the people that I know was a hero to you and played a major uh, part, of, uh, was a real force in women's consciousness and in the political struggle for the rights of women was Bella Absent. Can you tell us, the people who don't know about Bella, who she was, and how she influenced you. Well, she came out of Women's Strike for Peace, too. And I met her. We went on a big retreat to plan, to plan the next revolution of women. And I remember being just so struck with, so taken with her. And even then, she was, this was before she was a congresswoman. Even then, she was like this feisty, she was such a feisty woman. And she had her hats even then when we were out in hats. the country, boy. <laughs> But I thought she was amazing, and um, she she was so militant and so, but had so much heart and soul, and and she was so much. And other women kind of took care of her because she was like this force moving through the world. So Mimi, you were you were um, part of the change that occurred for women from. You, know, you, you witnessed the entire uh, incredible change that happened for women, and, and a lot of us, uh, when we started in the women's movement, had to make major personal changes in our personal lives. People had to shed boyfriends and husbands, and people had to make different decisions about whether or not to bear children. You had already had children, but how did, how did the women's movement play out for you, say, in the 60s? Um, did you have to shed a husband in the process or no? Well, yeah, so that was a combination <laughs> of the women's movement, but also the Three Penny Cinema, because when we started the Three Penny, which was a really important cultural event in Chicago. So my expectation, I ran the Three Penny. I picked all the movies, I did all the promotion, I did everything except negotiate the prices, which Johnny Rossin, who had fought in Spain with my husband, he did that. But I did everything else. And actually, I, I only recently realized that um, we gave Marty Scorsese his first chance. <laughs> Perfect. When nobody would open his movie, we, we opened his movie and gave him a world premiere. And we had the press party at the Oxford pub, which Stormy will remember vividly. All of us have vague recollection of <laughs> but that. But in, yeah, I... in any case, I was, I, was I was running the theater, so I was working constantly for the theater. I was trying to raise my family. Uh, I was trying to run my husband's business and keep a clean house. So I thought I was supposed to do all that and do it well. And so my day started like 7 a.m. and then it ended up at like, when I closed the theater at 11 at night or whatever, I was like going all the time doing, doing, doing. So when I would close the theater, my family was home asleep, asleep. already. 
So like a lot of people who work at night, you know. You went to Oxford. I went to the Oxford. And I, and I had met Roger Ebert then. Those were some good times those days. Well, Roger. Oxford was the greatest place. Because the Three Penny was the first run theater, we had um, critic screenings all the time. Yeah. So I knew all the, so I knew Gene. Gene was new, Roger was new. And so, so Roger started, Roger and I started hitting the streets together. And he would take me to a works and, he t and so on. So, and then the Oxford pub was always on my way home. Sure. So <laughs> I know that I know this the put a lot of strain. You could go next door and get onion rings, a big loaf of onion rings, and that whatever that bar was next door. In any so so actually this started and my, my feeling like I had to do all of this. I had no help. Mm. And that started so so that kind of life started putting a strain on my marriage. Sure. So. Um, um, and so my husband and I, we did, yes, we did split up. Luckily, years later, we got back together, and, I'm, nice. and he died in my arms. So I, I was really happy that we got back together and then our family, you know. And we were kind of together all through with the, um, with, with the kids. With the kids sure. You know, we did holidays and stuff. But, yeah. Well, I mean, so, on your mark, you, your turn. <laughs> I'm going to do it. We only um, have a few more minutes with you, and I, I want to make sure to ask all of our guests today, um, what's your first recollection uh, that, of walking into Women and Children First Bookstore? Well, you know, they were over in Lincoln Park where we lived. They were on Halstead, and we had this school. So another thing I did, we started an alternate. Well, we didn't start it. Uh, Dennis Cunningham Parents and school. Paul <laughs> Sills from Second City fame, they started... Um, the parents' school. The parents' school. And my kids came as the first refugees from public school. All their kids started out at the parents' school. But anyway, it was across the street from, we had it, one of our locations, many locations, was across the street from women and children. And what was your reaction? First, to and they were, and that? we were thrilled that they opened, and it was very exciting, and they've been such a force in the city and for women um, from day one and still are totally amazing. I have to say one thing about where women are at before we close and that is that even though all these changes have happened for women and we have found our voices and they're loud, actually women aren't in such a good place. You know. Uh, Today, women, uh, uh, we're still fighting the same, many of the same battles, and in some ways, things are even worse. Yeah, so, my, my wife, Storm, uh, excuse me, my wife Paige today pointed out to me that there was an article in the New York Times this morning about uh, how women who run museums get paid less than men for doing the same jobs. And we know that women get about 75%. Uh, pay scale of what men get. I would ask you in the last one minute we have Mimi Harris to what is your advice to young women or to any women and to men too about going forward in the world? You know, just keep on trucking, but, but be open and I really think people need to take a lot of action, but they really need to be open to kind of all the sides of everything. Because one of the mistakes, I think, and this is a mistake that young people make more than older, but a lot of older people make it too, is they get stuck in a certain way of thinking, and they're not really open mm. to the different shadings and nuances which really are critical to understanding the world and how to move in it. What a subtle and brilliant piece of oh, advice. Let's have a big round of applause for Mimi Harris. Uh, Nolan Chen's going to give us some music, and we'll be right back with more Live from the Heartland show. Stay tuned here at 88.7 on the left end of your dial. Be right back. Thanks, Thanks,